welcome. And I got to say thank you to the quartet. And it is, it's always the season of Bach. And you'll be treated to more Bach throughout this service. Thank you so much for coming. Now, you'll notice something is a little bit different today. Um, the thing that's different is that time and space are kind of collapsing. And we're moving into what Ray Bradbury called October country. October country is the country where the hills are fog and the rivers are mist and twilights linger and midnights stay. So happy Halloween, happy Sawit to our pagan friends, if I'm am I pronouncing that right, Celtic New Year. And I was going to say happy, uh, if Diana was here, I was going to say happy Dios de los Muertos. And as I understand how Day of the Dead works is that um, it's actually not a time of grieving. It's a, it's, in fact, it's a little bit insulting to your departed relatives to be mourning them on that day. It's really a party. And, uh, and so in that spirit, today is going to be a bit of a party. We're gonna, we're, it's going to be a rip-roaring hour. Uh, not much longer than that because I've got to get this suit back. Um, and so I think we've got to get started by singing. So um, we're going we're gonna to go right into gathering song number 1051 called We Are. And the lyrics should be here for you. For each child that's born, the morning star rises and sings to the universe. again. Thank you for coming to North Shore Unitarian where it is our mission to help us all collaborate on living lives of depth, meaning, and purpose. I am your ghoulish host, Jack Skellington. Actually, I'm your service associate, Bruce Grierson, and I, it's my pleasure to be with you this morning. If you're just visiting us, um, it's not always that weird around here. Uh, sometimes it is. Sometimes it's even weirder. Um, know that if you are new, that if you're exploring, you're exploring this faith, that, that your interest in exploring this faith is shared by those who've been coming here for 50 years and are still exploring this faith. You never get to the end of it. 
There are rooms beneath the rooms. There are chambers behind the bookcase. There are always new bats in the attic. And you'll be meeting some of them actually during the reflection today. In any case, we hope you feel welcome. Please ask anyone about anything, anytime. We meet here uh, every Sunday in this space in Coast Salish territory, particularly the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people whose traditional ancestral lands we're on right now. We are grateful to be able to gather here. It's good to be with you. Now the chalice lighting this morning, I'm going to invite up Pamela Berg. And uh, please welcome her. Pamela and her partner Peter, who is working the sound booth, you guys are heavily involved this morning, recently returned to NSUC. Yay! And Pam, you're also recently retired, which means you have more time for hobbies, travel and friends, and us. Pamela is currently helping with this endeavor to attract new faces to NS NSUC. Um, thank you so much, and if you will do the honors, we'll get uh, the chalice lit with these words. We kindle this flame as a symbol of our gathering. The veil is thin. That's the idea of Dios de los Muertos. Um, this is, there's a, a realm of the living and a realm of the dead, and right now the two circles have swung close, almost touching. If ever there were a time when communication with our beloved departed, departed was possible, it would, it would likely be right now. And so in that spirit, I'm going to invite you to speak the name of someone you're remembering today. Speak their name as if they can hear you. What we know for sure is that we can hear each other saying these names. Just put them into the air and say a name of somebody who's on your mind today. And I will start with Chris. Virginia. Jimmy. Bruce. Dorothy and Frank. Marsha. Sandra. Evans. Peter. Bobby. Gary Stewart. Thank you. Our final candle, Mr. Pamela Light is the candle of global concerns. And as ever with this one, I'm inclined to think that the less articulated about this, the better. Um, I think global concerns are kind of to be born. They're just to be taken on, born witness to. So, so we, I think in that, that spirit, we're gonna observe two minutes of silence now. I'll bring it out with, um, with a gong, but let's just take a moment. Let your heart go where it wants to go. And let's take our moment. Thank you. Now, just like there's never a bad time to play Bach, there's never a bad time to recite a Billy Collins poem. And luckily we have one of the best reciters around in Lila. This poem is called Afterlife. And as far as I know, Billy Collins was not a Unitarian, but he might as well be. Thanks. While you are preparing for sleep, brushing your teeth, or rifling through a magazine before bed, the dead of the day are setting out on their journey. They're moving off in all imaginable directions each according to his own private belief. And this is the secret that silent Lazarus would not reveal, that everyone is right, as it turns out. You go to the place you always thought you would, the place you keep lit in an alcove in your mind. Some are being shot into a funnel of flashing colors, into a zone of light, white as the January sun. Others are standing naked before a forbidding judge who sits with a golden ladder on one side, a coal chute on the other. Some have already joined the celestial choir and are singing as if they have been doing it forever, while the less inventive find themselves stuck in a big air-conditioned room full of food and chorus girls. Some are approaching the apartment of a female god a woman in her forties with short, wiry hair and glasses hanging from her neck by a string. 
With one eye, she regards the dead through a hole in the door. There are those who are squeezing into the bodies of animals, eagles and leopards, and one trying on the skin of a monkey like a tight suit, ready to begin another life in a more simple key, while others float off into some benign vagueness, little units of energy heading for the ultimate elsewhere. There are even a few classicists being led to the underworld by a mythological creature with a beard and hooves. He will bring them to the mouth of the furious cave, guarded over by Edith Hamilton and her three-headed dog. The rest just lie on their backs in their coffins, wishing they could return so they could learn Italian, or see the pyramids, or play mini-golf in light rain. They wish they could wake in the morning like you and stand at a window examining the winter trees, every branch traced with the ghost writing of snow. And some just smile forever on. Wonderful, wonderful. All righty. I want you to picture this day unfolding. Aliens have landed on Earth. Out they file from their ship, like War of the Worlds. And the Earthlings are terrified. It's game on. But wait, no, apparently the visitors come in peace. They aren't armed. They seem extremely chill, like they're comfortable in their pale white skin. They convey through gestures that they want to meet our leaders. So they're brought to the United Nations. And one of the aliens is carrying a book under his arm. It's in their language, obviously. The title is mysterious. Cryptographers in Washington snap into action to decipher the title, and they finally crack it. And the book is called To Serve Man. To Serve Man. Well, clearly these folks are here to help. They want to teach us what they know about how we can solve our problems, problems they clearly put behind them a long time ago, problems like war and hunger and scarcity. And so the humans are thrilled. And they come to trust 
this alien race of generous ambassadors. Everyone's getting on like a house on fire, and the aliens make a move to deepen the friendship. They invite us to their planet, and a whole bunch of Earthlings sign up for the trip. And just as the tail lights of the giant alien ship are disappearing into the sky with a cargo hold full of eager human tourists, the phone rings in the White House. It's a frantic cryptographer on the line. They've deciphered the rest of the book. To serve man, the cryptographer, in a shaky voice, says, "It's a cookbook." <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So, what twisted and what twisted soul hatched that little bonbon of a creep out story with that delicious twist ending? Well, the answer is this guy. This guy, Rod Serling. So today, as we approach Halloween and the 65th anniversary of a TV show that jangled our senses and stalked our dreams, it feels like a good time to pack our bags to a trip into another dimension. A dimension not of sight and sound, but of mind. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Can I ask, who, how many of you are familiar with this show? Did you, <laughs> this is the right crowd. <laughs> now, I, I got to confess, it, this, it wasn't as, um, I was born just a little bit late to, to see it come out live. It, it, I think it went off the air in like 1964, and it was in reruns by the time I got old enough to watch it. And even then, I only got to see it when I had an especially lenient babysitter. <laughs> but, um, but Rod Serling was a giant of 60s and 70s TV culture, and he became a powerful force in Hollywood, and a prickly one. He was constantly fighting with network executives who tried to censor his scripts, because a lot of the stories were social justice parables wrapped up in a spooky cloak. And the suits in Burbank were like, yeah, this is awesome, Rod. We can't possibly run it. And he'd go, what do you mean? And they'd say, well, it's too political. The sponsors will freak out. So Rod learned the important lesson that if you want to tell an uncomfortable truth, you can't be too direct. You have to make it a fantasy. Right? You want to talk about racism? You can't set it in Mississippi where actual viewers might recognize themselves among the racists. You have to set it in the pretend town of Dempseyville. You want to talk about slavery? You set that on another planet too. Maybe you call it the planet of the apes. That was Rod Serling too. Okay, so by this point, it won't surprise you to learn that Rod Serling was more than a brilliant writer of creepy stories with a moral sting in the tail. He was a fellow traveler. Let's see if we can get this going. For 50 years we've journeyed with Rod Serling into a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. Together we stepped into that middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition, to a place that lies between the pit of our fears and the summit of our knowledge. With Rod Serling as our guide, we entered the dimension of imagination, an area which we call the Twilight Zone. And on this anniversary, I'd like to invite you to take another journey, one that Rod Serling took often. For you see, what most Twilight Zone fans do not know is that Rod Serling was a Unitarian Universalist. There is a place full of people as creative, justice-seeking, and yes, weird as Rod Serling. Trust me, I know. A place that brings diverse people together around shared universal values. Fancy that. If you like the Twilight Zone and exploring deep and profound Mongo cosmic questions with other human beings, regardless of their set beliefs, you may very well enjoy participating in a Unitarian Universalist congregation. Chances are, there is one near you. All right. So that actually is a little video that plays. We, we got, at least we got the audio part of it. Now, how is that a, for a sizzler reel for Unitarian Universalism? You will explore deep and profundo cosmic uh, questions. I, I don't even know what it means exactly, but I like it. So I, I 
called this guy up uh, who created the clip, Peter Bowden, and he's a UU trainer and recruiter from out east. And, um, and I asked his permission to show it, and when I did, he said, you know, that video, I can't tell you how many people over the years have said, I had no idea. If Unitarian Universalism is good enough for Rod Serling, I think I better check it out. So Rod, a little more on him, he was actually raised a Jew, but he converted to Unitarianism in college. And tragically, he died young. A heart attack took him out at age 59. And at his funeral, the Unitarian Church in Santa Monica, that was his lifelong home, was packed. And when it came time for the eulogy, the pastor stepped aside and a close friend of Rod's stepped up to do the honors, a man named Gene Roddenberry creator of Star Trek, the show that would boldly go out into the universe with messages of peace and love and inclusiveness, and Gene said that without Rod Serling, Star Trek might never have existed. So that is a lot of cultural gravity in one place. That friendship of Rod Serling and Gene's, Gene Roddenberry, I think, in terms of their influence on the 20th century, I put it up there with Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. And in fact, if it's a cultural smackdown we're talking about here, Christians versus the Unitarians, I think the Christians win probably literary style points there, but the Unitarians win on the scope of their influence. Or maybe it's a tie. Anyway, the Twilight Zone was definitely a mouthpiece for Rod's own values. In every episode, he summoned a monster. But it was never an Old Testament kind of monster, like a serpent or a gorgon or whatnot. It was, it was way more recognizable than that. That jump scare face in the mirror, that's you and me. It's us at our worst. It's us caving to temptation and making some devilish deal. Like, you know, we get a little greedy. We skip the line. We rig the contest. We bag the prize only to realize too late the price of gaming the system. Be careful what you wish for. So says Pastor Rod. And in case you missed the point, Rod would stride out at the end of the episode and tell you. So that to serve man and that episode we were talking about, Rod explains that it's a cautionary tale about arrogance. Simply stated, Rod said, it is the story of the evolution of man. The cycle of going from dust to dessert. The, the metamorphosis from being the ruler of a planet to an ingredient in somebody's soup. It's tonight's bill of fare on the Twilight Zone. That's how they opened. So you know, when I studied creative writing, back, back when the earth was cooling, there was really only one rule, and that was don't be too explicit. Don't hammer your point. You know, you want to send a message? Call Western Union. They actually said that. <laughs> But Rod thought that advice was BS. He said, the writer is a menacer of the public sh public's conscience. That's their job. They must see their art, their art, I'm, clean I'm cleaning up the chauvinist language a bit here. They must see their art as a vehicle of social criticism. They must focus on the issues of their time. And horror was the perfect tool for that job in his view. Horror was the secret ingredient because what horror does is it gets the body involved. It cracks you open just long enough for him to slip his message in. One episode of The Twilight Zone I really liked was about a hit-and-run driver. A pedestrian steps in front of this guy's car one dark night and gets mowed down. The driver panics and leaves the scene. He lies low, hoping not to hear a knock at his door from the police. And the, but the, the knock never comes. And it looks like the driver's in the clear. There were no witnesses. But it turns out there was one witness, the car itself. And so the car starts behaving strangely. It starts slowly taking control of the vehicle. And it starts driving him back to the scene of the crime. <laughs> and the car, and I'm sure Rod explains this at the end, the car is his own conscience, right? And eventually the car takes him to the police station where, almost driven mad by this point, he turns himself in. Writers are never entirely healthy people. <laughs> they, they have their demons. That's why they write. And Rod Serling had his demons big time. He, was, he saw too much too early. He was a high school student 
when World War II broke out. He was eager to fight the Nazis. He was chomping at the bit. The day after he graduated, he enlisted. He got posted to the Philippines and wound up in a foxhole. And what he experienced there broke him a little bit. He had nightmares and flashbacks for the rest of his life. He had severe PTSD. He wrote his way out of it. In those trenches, you knew that death could come at any moment. Death, death was always, you might say, just a jump scare away. And that vibe, that cock trigger, that coiled spring vibe permeated every one of his scripts. Rod was haunted and he sent his own ghosts out to haunt us. Now some Twilight Zone episodes were kind of hokey, but the scary ones, man, it was almost clinical the way they worked on you. Like the pressure under the lid of the box built until it couldn't be contained. Richard Matheson, one of his main writers, said that in every episode of The Twilight Zone, there's always one moment when fear starts to spread like a virus. I got curious about this quote. I did a little research watching old episodes to see what those moments have in common when fear starts to spread like a virus. And I discovered it's very often the moment where the hero of the story gets cut away from the herd and they suddenly find themselves alone. They're going through this hellish predicament and there's no backup and it's like, oh crap, this is going down right now and I'm on my own because I have been abandoned. I've been abandoned. That is such a primal fear. Our deepest fears are the ones that are, as they say, ancestrally relevant, meaning that they're the ones that have haunted humans forever, right? Rats, yeah, these will, they'll give you the plague. That's why they freak us out even now. A call coming from inside the house, get out. You are not safe in your cave. The bad dudes have breached the perimeter. These are primal fears. Even something like public speaking, which people routinely list as their number one fear. You know, there's that Seinfeld bit about how most people at, at a funeral would rather be, the guy, rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. <laughs> which is, this is kind of, but it's, and it, so it seems so silly. But when you think about it, it too is ancestrally relevant. You know, your lizard brain knows why you're scared. It's because back on the savannah, if you were staring into the faces of a bunch of strangers, it meant that you were probably about to figure into their dinner plans and not in a good way. You were, you were, you were about to meet a bad end with these strangers. And so you're just up there exposed and alone and vulnerable. That is the stuff of our nightmares, right? So you would think, you would think that these kinds of primal fears, these kinds of deep, deep feelings of unpleasantness, we would want to avoid them. We would want to avoid them at all costs. But what do we do instead? We lean into them. We eagerly tune into shows like The Twilight Zone to voluntarily scare the daylights out of, out, out of ourselves. What the heck is going on here? Well, I will tell you what's going on. But first, a word from our sponsor or at least some full body bridge music from Alice. So back to this question of why we would ever want to voluntarily scare the daylights out of ourselves. Well, Joseph Campbell had an answer. If you asked him, Joe, what's it all about? What are we doing here? Are we looking for the meaning of life? He would say, we are not. We are not looking for the meaning of life. What we are looking for is the feeling of being alive. And that's something that's hard to put into words, but you know it, you know it, when it breaks over you, 
and all your senses are on high alert and every hair on your skin standing up like a little antenna, heart a quiver. Geez, that almost sounds like religious ecstasy or a spiritual reckoning of some kind, right? This is why the Old Testament is full of terrifying stories. It's why people used to go to church to feel that intensity, the intensity of being alive. And even today, it's why many people seek out in church or in temple or in mosque something like that, some, like some kind of experience like that. Annie, Annie Dillard said, church, when it's done right, should make you want to wear a crash helmet in there. It's like, makes you feel like you want to be lashed to the pews. And even Unitarians, I don't think, if it was all just cerebral, I don't think you would feel like you got the full Monty. I think you might, that way, you might as well just be in a book club, right? We want the wild God to show up a little bit, even if the wild God is just a shimmer that runs through you at some point and you go, whoa, that got me in the feels. Yep. I am another level of alive right now. And that's something we hardly ever experience in the normal run of things in our lives. But we crave to. We crave to feel like that. We crave a taste of that urgency. The urgency tells you you've entered the extraordinary world. That's a Joseph Campbell phrase. It's existential. It's the same feeling people get, they say they get when they have a gun to their head. Or when they're looking into the face of a lion in the wild and it roars. A lion's roar at close quarters apparently just stops the blood. That's ancestral fear right there. That feeling that, oh my gosh, I'm right up against it. That's what the horror writers are trying to capture, and the best ones do capture. Now, I know what you're, what you're, you're thinking. We all know that it's not real, right? That's, that's the nut here. When you're watching a movie or you're reading a Stephen King novel, you aren't really in any physical danger. And that difference between what we feel and what we know to be true is the heart of all of this. So there's a psychologist in Denmark called Matt Klassen, and he runs this lab with the best title ever, the Recreational Fear Lab. And he has a theory, which he spent his career developing, and it's that people are drawn to what he calls recreational fear, like, you know, roller coasters, jump scares, horror movies, because these kinds of things are training platforms. They're like a gym for our nervous system. They offer ways of tuning and testing our emotional regulation under safe conditions. You know, your brain thinks of it like play. It's preparing you, kind of the way that rough and tumble play among bear cubs prepares them for having to bring it one day in a fight, you know, as adult, as adult bears. So for us, we can get scared of this pretend, of this pretend threat, re threat, really scared of it, and then we handle it. And that conditions us to handle strong emotions when we come face to face, to face or with a real threat in our lives. It trains our endocrine systems for that insult so that we don't become paralyzed or faint, but instead we just stand in there and do the job. Well, so that's the, that's the theory. And there is evidence that it's true. One of Matt's colleagues did a fascinating study. Turns out that people who are regular consumers of horror movies fared a lot better during the first COVID lockdown than people who stay away from scary movies. Just psychologically, they coped better. It was like they had been inoculated and they had been inoculated by the continu continuous low-level drip of recreational fear. We want to be scared a little bit. It seems to be in us to enjoy being scared a little bit. You know, a baby loves being tossed in the air or startled in a game of peekaboo. A little, not too much. There's a sweet spot. Too little fear is boring and too much fear freaks us out. So, the sweet spot, that Goldilocks point in the middle of just manageable fear, that's where you grow. That's where your resilience develops. And that's why Matt says, for example, that we shouldn't shield kids from things that frighten them. And I actually think we've done a pretty good job of that here in this congregation at Halloween time. 
you know, a whole generation of kids grew up having their pants scared off them here at Halloween, when we turned this place into the best darn haunted house on the North Shore. It was always something the youth put on, and they really got into it. They cooked up a theme, and they rounded up props. Doug Sabrin con contributed a fog machine. And the kids would, little kids would parade through, and the youth would work it so that they calibrated the fear according to who their customers were at any time. So the little kids would come through first, and that would be the scare meter set at level one. You know, no jump scares, just spooky, mu spooky music, a creepy, ap creepy atmosphere. Then the slightly older kids came, and that's level two, and that's a little more intense. You'd take your customers past the basement window, and you'd peek in, and there'd be like an evil lab down there, and a mad scientist administering a lethal dose of, of electricity to some hapless victim. I doubt you could get away with any of it today, actually. <laughs> but one year we painted a giant pentagram on the floor in blood. And then we had to be gently taught by the Wiccans among us that it's actually not cool to make fun of other people's religion. Right? Not a devil cult, a pagan simple, that pentagram. Big mis misstep there. We fixed it the next year by creating our own symbol, an upside-down chalice that looked kind of sinister. So the kids had a ball, and honestly, it was a really interesting exercise for the youth advisors like me and the adults who were involved. We scavenged our attics for stuff that might scare kids because we knew it had scared us at that age. And I gotta say, this has all been eye-opening for me working on this service. You know, you go down these memory holes, and it's amazing what you find in there. I remembered how as a kid, I was super scared of my bedroom closet. It was this dark cave. And there was a mannequin head in there with a wig on it for some reason. I think it was my mom, <laughs> must have been my mother's. And it totally freaked me out. If the lights got shut off and that door was left open, and I didn't have my little blanket as a shield, I, I, it was like deep animal fear. And, you know, at some level, you knew your parents were in the vicinity, if you were lucky because that's a story that every parent plants in you if you're a kid. Again, if you're lucky, you are safe. You are safe with us. But then horror stories come along and they undermine that and they say, you thought you were safe? Ha! Think again, Buster. And now you're going, uh-oh, if I'm not safe and they told me I was safe, what else have they told me that isn't true? And now your trust in your frontline people is starting to crack. And that, I think, is why we go to church. Maybe. Partly. For a kid, what a church community like this it does is it, it provides backup. And the congregation goes, we are a village. We are here for you. Even if the monsters overpower your parents, they still got to get by us. And we are armed with coffee spoons <laughs> and soup ladles. And we are all exploring our limits here, folks. We've got this together. And we'll be right back after some more atmospheric music from Allison. Don't touch that dial. Shame we don't have any kids in the fold right at the moment because I feel like now more than ever we could use some recreational horror therapy. You know, we need a booster shot against the real horrors of the world that seem to, seem to be more ominous and ravenous than ever. The world feels unsafe. There's actually a strange disconnect between how safe the world actually is for most people most of the time, with some obvious terrible exceptions, and how unsafe it feels. But that's another issue. 
the world feels unsafe. It feels like some monster is chasing us with an axe. And you can call that monster COVID, or you can call it global warming, or you can call it AI. This is interesting. I discovered that both Stephen King and Rod Serling, when they were asked, what scares you? They had the same answer. The answer was getting dementia. That's the one thing we have, the one thing that we have control over most of the time is our own thoughts. But what if a bug gets in the system and our thoughts get corrupted? And now these days we have to ask, what if a bug gets into AI and replication errors start compounding and we suddenly realize the system we're handing over the running of the world to has mad cow disease? So that's a sci-fi fear. But we needn't get that abstract about the monster that's chasing us with an ax. For a lot of people, it's basic economics. You're one missed paycheck away from not making the rent. You know, fear of falling, falling into debt, falling into insolvency, falling out with your family, falling out of favor, losing your tribe, losing your job. We say, you got the ax. Maybe ending up on the street. This is the twilight zone for real. There's a fellow named Brandon Graffius who teaches biblical studies at an amazingly named place called the Ecumenical Theological Seminary in Detroit. And I heard him interviewed one time. He claims that fear in a culture ebbs and flows in response to our anxieties at a given moment. The things that scare us most have activated an unmet need. So remember in the 80s when there was that whole spate of slasher films, Nightmare on Elm Street and Halloween and the like. In his view, what was going on here was this was a conservative backlash to the lefty progressive movements of the 70s, chiefly feminism. So the Hollywood suits were going, wait, oh, we're losing control here. Our families are collapsing. This has gotten way too loosey-goosey. Let's bring in Freddy Krueger and his knives to reassert patriarchal authority through violence. That may be a bit of a stretch. Maybe it's true. But then this fellow, Brendan Graffia, said something fascinating. He made the connection between fear and hope. One of our deepest fears, maybe our deepest fear, is that our hopes will be dashed and everything we've been building toward, everything we've been banking on will just go pfft. And then on the other side of the coin, our deepest hope is that the stuff we fear the most won't happen, at least for a while. The people and animals we love won't leave us for a while. So you have this dance of fear and hope, each reflecting the other each defining the other. The contours of hope are shaped by fear. And fear is contained, in a sense, by hope. And the message deep down is that there exists a kind of antidote to fear, an antidote. And it's not a sci-fi thing, and it's not a complicated abstract thing, it's a simple thing, and it exists right now, and it's available to all of us. Okay, you're ready for a very Unitarian moment? And I'm sorry this is going to sound like a sermon for about five seconds, but it'll be over in a flash, I promise. The, an the antidote to fear is love. In the twilight zone, the monster was us. It was some part of us, the part that we were trying to suppress, our worst self, our shadow self. And what's the way to defeat a shadow? You hit it with light. And that's what love does. It overwhelms the darkness. It drives out fear. You give it, you get it, and it drives out fear. To truly feel yourself beloved is to become fearless. The two primary emotions aren't love and hate. They're love and fear. And here is the million dollar idea here. It's impossible to feel those two things at the same time. Fear cannot exist when there is love in the room. So now, if you will indulge me, I want to try a little exercise. I'm going to ask you all to take a deep breath and sit comfortably in your chair. And we're, going to let, we're all going to let our minds drift back in time. And I want you to think of something that scared you 
quite a bit as a child. You know, for me it was that open closet door in the bedroom. For you it might be something completely different. Let yourself go back to that time and place. And as you do, Allison is going to play some gentle music in the background to help with the passage back. Go back in time to when you were a child. Back to the scene of something frightening. Probably you were alone. Maybe you're at home. Maybe you're far from home. Whatever the scenario is for you, we're going to go and be in the shadow of that thing for a moment, not too long, just for a moment or two. And try to remember what it felt like to be frightened like that as a little kid. Try to inhabit it. Really try to feel it. And with that, we move into our offering. Thank you so much for indulging me there.
Thank you so much for these gifts and all you do to help us weave the tapestry of love that we call community. We are very thankful. Thank you so much. Alrighty, and now we just have a few announcements. There's a fair bit going on at the moment, so I urge you to check your e-bulletin for what I can't cover here this morning. Uh, after the service here, please join us downstairs for lunch and to decompress from what I've put you through this morning. There will be some lovely sandwiches by, uh, put on by Diane Hicks, suggested donation is $5. If you didn't bring any money and you just want a sandwich, that's okay too. Um, you know, in keeping with the spooky vibe of the season, there's a fun fest activity coming up here um, that, that Trisha Mason's putting on. Sounds fascinating. She says, settle down beside the fireside for an atmospheric true story about English eccentric Charles Wade and his bizarre life in the Cotswolds. So Trisha will host this at her home beside the forest. The story will be accompanied by images and music. Light supper provided at 6.30 p.m. maximum, 10 guests, and I think there's still space if you want to um, approach uh, Jenny or Trisha about that. Next Sunday, uh, it looks like a not-to-miss service that Allison is calling We Are Alchemists. Allison will explore ways in which we affect change inside and outside, within our own psyches and out in the world. Change is good. Allison is good. <laughs> now we're going to close with hymn number 1056, Tula Gleseo. And the words will be on your screen. bamboozling. Tula. Cliseo. Nala. Passe. Kaya. Tula Cliseo. Nala passe Kaya. Tula Cliseo. Nala passe Kaya. Tula Cliseo. Nala passe Kaya. Hey Kaya. Hey, Kaya. Nala passe Kaya. Nala passe Kaya. Hey, Kaya. Hey, Kaya. Nala passe Kaya. Nala passe Kaya. Be still my heart, even here where it's spooky. I am at home. Please rise. <laughs> We've had an amazing hour together. Um, on your way home, I'm going to suggest, if you have the time, take a detour through the cemetery next door and look at the epitaphs on the tombstones. Think of them each as an away message. Like, I'm out of the office, I've stepped away. Thank you for checking in. Look for the blackest marble tombstone, and if the light's right, you'll see yourself in it. Smile, look at those teeth. They're the only parts of your skeleton that you can see. You're still above ground. That's a good thing. Let's extinguish our flame. We extinguish this flame. The world calls us to live with depth, meaning, and purpose. Remember, folks, even with all the ominous events in the offing right now, geopolitically, politically, this is not a bad dream we need to wake up from. It's a good dream we need to make happen. You, you up. 
Let's circle around.